after some days and it was noise that he was in the house and immediately many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And there came unto him, bringing one that was sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come near to him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, and when they had uh, broken it up, they had let him down in the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes that were sitting there, and they were reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were so reasoning within themselves, he said unto them, Why do you reason these things in your hearts? What is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins are forgiven? Or to say, Arise and take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto you, Arise and take up your bed and go your way into your house. And immediately he arose and took up the bed and went forth before them all insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, We've never seen anything like this. Now in the last part of chapter 1 as we were studying the first chapter of Mark, we remember that this man who was a leper came to Jesus saying, Lord, if you will, you could make me clean. And Jesus said, I will. And he touched him and the man was healed of his leprosy. Jesus told him to go show himself to the priests and offer those things that was commanded in the law of Moses in order that he might return home. Now, this man began to go around telling everybody of how Jesus healed him of leprosy. In fact, the word got around so much so that we read that Jesus couldn't any longer go into the cities because of the tremendous crowds of people. He had to stay out in the deserted areas and the people came out to him. But he evidently had slipped into Capernaum and had gone into a house. But before long, someone no doubt had seen him and they started saying, Jesus is in town. No, he's at the house of maybe Peter, I don't know. And, and they, they, crowds began to assemble until there wasn't room in the house to hold them and, and they were crowded around the door. You can even get near the door. And there were four fellows who had a buddy who had been paralyzed. We don't know how he was paralyzed, but the word palsy is actually just a shortened version of the word paralyzed. It could be that he was paralyzed as the result of a stroke. Or it could be, as was very common in those days, that he was paralyzed as the result of syphilis. They did not have any drugs for the curing of syphilis in those days. And as it progresses in the body, the deteriorating of the brain and all, one of the things that often happens was that a paralysis would set in. By what cause he was paralyzed, we do not know, but we do know that these four friends of his 
were determined to bring him to Jesus because they had confidence that Jesus could heal their paralyzed friend so he could join with them again in their fellowship. Now when they came to the house where Jesus was, they saw the crowd and they realized that there was no way they could carry the bed through that crowd into the house to get their friend to Jesus. But these are the kind of fellows that you have met. They're very enterprising, very determined, and very innovative. I have a son who's like that. You want to get in anywhere, just ask him and he'll get you in. And so in apprising the situation, probably one of them went in and scouted the thing out. He made his way through the crowd and scouted it and, and realized where Jesus was sitting in the house as he was preaching to the people. And so they went up on the roof and they uncovered the roof. They took off the tiles, uncovered the roof. And then they let their friend in the stretcher down in front of Jesus. So as Jesus was speaking to the people, suddenly, you know, there's the commotion on the roof, and then here comes this guy slowly down in front of Jesus, you know. Now, had you been sitting there, I would imagine that you would have wondered, what in the world is going on up there on the roof? What's all that noise and racket? I imagine that Jesus, when this fellow just came slowly down, I imagine Jesus sort of chuckled. I, I really see him just, you know, just looking up and just, uh, I, I think he was amused by that. The owner of the house was probably thinking, who's going to pay the bill to repair my roof, you know? <laughs> and as the man was set down in front of Jesus, Jesus, seeing their faith, said, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. I imagine that the friends thought, No, 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 that's not why we brought him. We want him to walk. We want you to heal him. And I imagine that that they, they were perhaps a little disturbed that Jesus would say, your sins are forgiven you. That's not why we brought him. You know, it is rather sad that many times people do come to Jesus for some of the peripheral benefits rather than for the basic need. Jesus knew that the basic need in this man was the forgiveness of sins. That's more important than the healing of his paralysis. There may be some of you who are in trouble and think, Oh, Jesus, I want you to heal my marriage. I want you, Lord, to take care of my financial problems. Or, or maybe you are sick and, and you want the Lord to heal you, but if there is sin in your life, it's much more important that the first issues be dealt with first. You say, you may say, Lord, my friend is, is, is becoming an alcoholic. He's drinking. I can see the signs of alcohol. Lord, help him not to drink anymore. Stop his drinking, Lord. And the Lord may stop his drinking and he die a sober sinner. So, you see, the real need hasn't been taken care of. And Jesus saw the real need and he said, Son, thy sins are forgiven. Now, the reaction of the scribes, Mark tells us. He said they were upset. They began to reason among them in their minds. They thought, wait a minute. Who is he? Who does he think he is? That's blasphemy only God can forgive sins why is he speaking so blasphemously 
They were correct in their assessment. Only God can forgive sins. For you see, all sin is against God, the commandment and the law of God. It may affect others, but sin is against God. David, in Psalm 51, as he was seeking the mercy of God and praying for the forgiveness of his sins, declared, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this great evil in thy sight. He acknowledged that his sin was against God. I've sinned against you. Though his sin had an effect upon Bathsheba and especially the husband of Bathsheba, yet the sin was against God because it was God who said, thou shalt not commit adultery. So oftentimes, our sins hurt us. You see, God knows that there are certain things that are harmful to you. And thus, he forbids you to do those things that destroy you. Many times, our sins are destructive to others. But the sin is against God. You say, well, he's sinning against himself. Well, he is reaping the result of his sin, but his sin is against God. So they were right. Only God can forgive sin because all sin is against God. You may go around and spread lies about me. Oh, I don't think you would, but some evil person might. <laughs> and they, they go around and, and just deliberately spread lies, and then they feel convicted. They know that they've been lying, and, and it's begun to have an effect in the community. The rumor is being spread, you know, did you know that Pastor Smith, and, you know, their lie is being spread. And so they come and they say, Chuck, I don't know what got into me. I don't know what came over me. I knew it wasn't true, but I told the people that you were doing this, and I am so sorry. Would you please forgive me? Well, I'm bound by the scripture to say yes I forgive you because Jesus said if a brother offends against you and he repents, then you're to forgive him. But my forgiveness doesn't really take care of the whole issue. You see, I can say I forgive you, but that doesn't absolve you from your guilt. Because your sin is really against God. It is God who said, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. So what is more important than getting my forgiveness is to get the forgiveness of God. Now getting my forgiveness may be the first step in getting the forgiveness of God. If your brother offend against you, go first to your brother, get things straightened there, and then come and offer your gift. But sin is against God, and only God can forgive sin. And so the reaction of the friends was probably disappointment. The reaction of the scribes was being upset and challenging him for what they considered to be blasphemy. But for the man himself, I believe when Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven. I think that there was a burst of joy, a great relief, and just a, a sense of, all right. Because I believe that he was carrying this heavy guilt of sin 
and was in a continual remorse for what he had done. I, I do believe that the paralysis was probably the result of syphilis. Jesus seemed to relate the problem with sin. And here he is paralyzed now as this disease is taking its toll upon his body. And I can imagine day after day as he is lying there unable to move that he thinks, oh, how stupid I was. Why did I ever do that? Why did I disobey the law of God? And, and there it was daily the constant reminder, I'm in this condition because of my own stupid folly, because I disobeyed the laws of God. And, and something like that would just hound you day and night as, as you would try to do something and realize I can't do it, I'm paralyzed because I sinned, I disobeyed the commandment of God and now this has resulted in my body as a result of my own sin and folly. And I think something like that could just plague a person giving them a guilt complex that just wouldn't quit. They say that most neurosis is associated to guilt complex. That the neurosis results from a subconscious desire for punishment. Subconsciously, I am desiring to somehow atone or feel that I have atoned for the wickedness that I have done. And thus I develop a neurotic behavior pattern to bring the disapproval or the anger or the ire of, of, of someone upon me in order that they might verbally lash out at me or whatever in order that I can feel like I've atoned, I've been punished for what I did. Guilt complex is hard to live with. As David in the psalm that we read this morning said, Day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. And I felt like I was just all dried up inside like the drought of summer. God's heavy hand and that sense of guilt just weighing him down. That's why David said, Oh, how happy is the man whose sins are forgiven. When the prophet said to David, Thou art the man. And David said, I have sinned against God. And the prophet said, Your sin is forgiven. Oh, David said, Oh, how happy is the man whose sins are forgiven. And so I believe with this man carrying this guilt, when Jesus looked at him and said, Son, thy sins are forgiven thee. I think there was a burst of joy, a thrill. Oh, all right. Oh, thank you, Lord. The weight is gone. That heavy hand of God is lifted. And, and you feel that glorious burst of joy. My sins are forgiven. Having said that, Jesus then addressed himself to the reactions of the scribes and their accusation of blasphemy because he said, your sins are forgiven. And Jesus said unto them, what would be easier to say that to this man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? What would be easier to say? Well, of course it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because who can prove whether or not you have any authority or power in your words? There's not going to be any immediate visible kind of evidence that you have real power. I mean, I might go around or, uh, you know, uh, just... Uh, dress up in righteous robes and just go around and say, your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven. Sins are forgiven. <laughs> I mean, that's easy to say. And, and people, when they say, my, what a mighty man of power, they say, my, what a nut, you know.
But Jesus is saying, what's easier to say then? To say your sins are forgiven or to say, rise and take up your bed and walk? Obviously, it would be more difficult to say, rise, take up your bed and walk because if the fellow struggles and just lies there still, you'd say, well, he doesn't have any power in his words. There's no authority in his words. Those are just empty words. But if you say, rise, take up your bed and walk, and the fellow rises and takes his bed and begins to walk out of the place, then you say, ooh, there's power in this man's words. You can see it. You, there's, there's the immediate uh, proof of the power of the man's word. So it would have been much more difficult to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. So Jesus then said, that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralyzed man, take up your bed, rise, take up your bed and go home. And the fellow rose, took his bed, and as he was walking out the door, everybody said, ooh, we've never seen anything like this before. Amazing. Power in the word of Jesus. Now Jesus here took a messianic title, referring to himself as the Son of Man, that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. In Daniel chapter 7, beginning with verse 13, he said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like unto the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given to him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. He took this title, Son of Man, from Daniel, which was a common accepted title for the Messiah that you might know that the Messiah has power on earth to forgive sins. Now, going back to their assessment, no one can forgive sins but God. And now proving that he has power and there is authority in what he says by the fact that the man is walking, which was much more difficult to say than to say your sins are forgiven. Now, in their assessment, no one can forgive sins but God. The obvious conclusion must be in that he has shown that he has the power and authority to speak words of power. It must be that he is God. If only God can forgive sins, and he says, with power and authority, which he proves, your sins are forgiven. It must be indeed that he is the Messiah, that he is God. The prophet Isaiah said, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Here's another promise of the Messiah, who was to be called the mighty God, who can forgive sins but God. And he proved that there was authority in his words by saying, rise, take up your bed and walk that he is God. And if indeed his word is spoken with authority and power, 
then it would be well for us to take heed to what he has said, even in other places. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father but by me. That means that you can't get to God by being religious. That you can't get to God by being good, by trying hard. You cannot get to God except through Jesus Christ. No one comes to the Father, he said, but by me. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. There is power and authority in what he has said. Which means that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you will not perish. But you will receive God's gift of eternal life. For he went on to say, for the Father did not send me into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. And he who believes in me is not condemned. But he who doesn't believe in me is condemned already because he has not believed on the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world but they will not come to the light. For men hate the light, and they love the darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. We see in our world today men who hate the light, men who are striking out against the light, more and more in the liberal press and in the liberal politics, there are voices speaking out against the light because they hate the light and they love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Jesus said, and whosoever believes in me shall never perish. His word is true. He spoke with authority and power. He proved that he was God. And to believe in him, to surrender your life to to him is to surrender your life to the authority of God. It is now to live a life that is marked by love and kindness, gentleness and goodness, meekness and temperance, rather than a life of hatred, strife, envy, promiscuousness. It means a change of life. Because you're submitting to his authority, you're receiving him as your Lord. But when you do, you hear those glorious words as he speaks to the soul, your soul. Son, your sins are forgiven. And you will know that burst of joy, that blessing, that peace, that relief. I'm forgiven. Yes. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. That we have your promise that if we will just confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, there are those here today whose lives are being destroyed because of their sin. They look back upon it and 
they rue the day they did it. And it's been hanging heavy, heavy, heavy on them. That sense of guilt and they see the results, the damage that has been done, not only to themselves, but many times to others. And Lord, it's just a heavy load to try and carry, sometimes too heavy. And we thank you for the words of Jesus. When he invited those who were heavy laden to just come to him, and they would find rest for their souls. Lord, we pray today for those that are burdened down by the sense of guilt of their past and what they have done. May they, Lord, discover rest for their souls, their troubled souls, in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.